Let's get started. So, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, <laughs> nice to see you all. I had Alan. You're Alan, is that right? Uh, yeah, I have some questions for you. Uh, maybe this evening at the Q and A, I can answer those questions at you. So please remind me this evening when we do the Q and A. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, we're going to start to uh, uh, look more at meditation practice uh, and uh, what to do about it uh, and how to go about practicing meditation uh, and uh, you, the way I usually like to do okay is the sound okay or is it too loud? is it alright? Uh, too loud, yeah, okay so bring it, bring it down a little bit Bobby uh, so it's just right, just nice not too jarring okay, how was that? Better, uh, worse, no, no difference, uh, still the same. Uh. <laughs> okay, Bobby, now, oh, okay, is that okay? Yeah, okay, now we're getting there, okay, good. <laughs> so the way I, I like to do these things on meditation retreats is to, uh, first of all, give a general talk about meditation at the beginning, uh, and that's what I will do now. Uh, and then as uh, we carry on during the next four days, uh, uh, I will be talking about the suttas, and of course the point about the suttas is that they also contain a lot of information about meditation practice. Uh, so in a sense, by looking at the suttas, uh, we'll be kind of reinforcing the message that I want to give this morning, just throughout, uh, about meditation practice, uh, and looking at meditation from various angles. Uh, and uh, also there will be some guided meditations, uh, and uh, the purpose for that uh, of that is uh, basically also to kind of reinforce the instructions, just to remind you, yeah, and it's not, I, it's not, sometimes I may not say very much during the guided meditation, sometimes it's just nice to sit together to get, you know, a good feeling, yeah, uh, and just to guide a tiny little bit, just to remind you of the basics of how to get going. Yeah. It's so easy to forget this, uh, and especially on a meditation retreat like this, which is uh, some people are staying here, some are not, uh, and uh, sometimes because it's not a very strict retreat, uh, it's easy to kind of, you know, go back into the old habits and the old way of doing things. Uh, so it's good to be reminded of uh, how to do the practice. Uh, so I'm going to start out, and one of the things that I have learned from Ajahn Brahm a long time ago is the idea, he, he said that most people, when they do meditation, they go to the meditation object too quickly. Yeah. And uh, I thought that was a very good piece of advice, because uh, that's what most people do, they sit down, and if they're going to do breath meditation, they go straight to the breath, straight away, and they start watching the breath. And th if you go to the breath straight away, especially if you come from a busy life with work and all kinds of things, uh, uh, the only way you're going to be able to hold on, uh, be with the breath, is by grasping onto it, it's the only way. Yeah. And it's kind of not going to be really relaxed, it's not going to be comfortable, it's not going to be nice. Uh, so one of the things that I, you know, from, take, uh, that I take from Ajahn Brahm is the idea of really taking a long time before you go to the meditation object to make sure that you give rise to mindfulness, that the mind is in the right position, the body feels just right, uh, and then you go to the meditation object. Uh, and it's not just Ajahn Brahm, this is also found in the suttas. Uh, if you look at the way that Anapanasati is explained in the suttas, if you go to the Anapanasati sutta, which is kind of the classical sutta on mindfulness of breathing, yeah, the Buddha says in there that first of all you establish mindfulness. Yeah? It says, Satting Padimukkang Upatapetva. I always like to quote a bit of Pali because it makes me sound more professional. Yeah? <laughs> then you are more impressed with me, then I have more authority, then you will listen more. So <laughs> a quote a bit of Pali is always wise. So, Satting Padimukkang Upatapetva means uh, you have established mindfulness, parimukkang. Parimukkang is a slightly controversial word, but probably means something like in front of you, or in here, right here, in the present space. Uh, 
So you establish mindfulness first, then you do the mindfulness of breathing. This is directly from the Anapanasati Sutta, not the other way around. You don't establish mindfulness by watching the breath, no. You establish mindfulness first, then you watch the breath afterwards. Uh, and the reason for that, again, is because then it's easy. Uh, it's natural, there's a flow to the process, uh, which is very easy and very calming and very uh, generally speaking, you feel good about it. You don't feel any tension. Too many people, they feel tension in meditation because they're trying too hard. Uh, and that is the sort of thing you want to avoid. Uh, too many people, they go to one meditation retreat, uh, they never go back again, ever afterwards. Uh, it's such a shame, yeah, if that happens, because meditation, the whole Buddhist path, has so much potential to change us, to alter, to bring us uh, much more quality of life. And if we get it wrong in the beginning, we throw all that potential out of the window, huh, and it's all gone, and we never really uh, get the benefits of this beautiful path. Huh. So please try to be, be, be careful. I'm not saying that meditation is going to be 100% comfortable and at, at ease all the time. That's impossible. That's just not the way the world works or the body works. Uh, but we should generally lean in that direction. Huh. Yeah. So this is the first thing. That's what it says in the Anapanasati Sutta. You look at the Satipatthana Sutta, it says something very similar. It says of the quality of the Satipatthana that it's Satima. Satima means you are mindful. Huh. So again, uh, you are mindful uh, while you're doing satipatthana. The purpose of satipatthana is not to give rise to mindfulness, uh, it is to apply mindfulness in the right way. Uh. That's what satipatthana is all about. Uh. Yeah, and this is why the translation, foundations of mindfulness, is not a very good translation because the foundation of mindfulness uh, gives the idea that you do this practice uh, as a soul, as a basis for mindfulness. It's a foundation for mindfulness. Yeah, it gives rise to mindfulness. But no, what the Sutta is saying is you have mindfulness while you do this practice. In other words, you have to establish it first, then you use it, you apply it in certain areas. So that's why I like the translation the four applications of mindfulness, I think is a better way of doing it. Or uh, you know, something like that, the four focuses of mindfulness, the four establishments of mindfulness, uh, but certainly not the four foundations of mindfulness. Small little things in translation can make a big difference in how we perceive the meaning of these terms. Uh, you may never even think about it, it may never even occur to you that there is a problem there, but still it has a subconscious effect sometimes uh, on how we uh, look at these things and how we deal with them. Welcome, please come in, yeah, please take a seat. <laughs> Very good here. So, um, so this is uh, an important point. So take, you know, take your time, relax, enjoy, be at ease, and allow the process to kind of happen gradually. Yeah. And uh, to start out, for this process to work, it is so one of the things I always like to talk about at the very beginning, which we have talked about in the past few days a little bit already, is the many here who have just arrived, who have just come, who haven't, haven't been here over the last few days. Uh, yeah, there's a few of you here. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, okay, great. So I'm gonna. So I, I will repeat a little bit because many of these things are uh, the things that are you know important for the meditation practice anyway. So uh, Buddhism is very much about repeating things and allowing things gradually to sink in. Uh, yeah, and I always feel in good company because when you read the suttas, they're very repetitive. Uh, so if the Buddha could repeat, then surely I can repeat as well. That's what I what I reckon. <laughs> yes. Sir. So many of, of sati. Uh, yeah. Okay, what it means, uh, yeah, uh, what it actually means, the word mindfulness, uh, what do you mean? Yeah, what well, the meaning of the word mindfulness? Is uh, yeah. Uh, is yeah. Yeah. What is it? What, what is mindfulness? Okay, well, let's, let, me, let me get back to that, yeah, because I'm still kind of moving towards mindfulness. Now we're just at the very beginning here, so we're kind of coming to mindfulness gradually here. So let me get back, let me talk about that later on. Just remind me, when I come to the word mindfulness, then say, stop, yeah, and then I will, then I will touch on, on the exact definition of how it is explained in the suttas at that particular point. Yeah. So, um, uh, you have to, w when we, 
so it's so important to start in the right place. And sometimes some of the very simple little things that we do in the beginning have a big impact on how our meditation works out. And uh, one of the uh, most important things to start off with is just to be comfortable. Yeah, and just to be at ease where you are. And uh, so an important part of this is, also is uh, the idea of the right posture in meditation. And very often when you read things like the Anapanasati Sutta, it says you sit down, uh, you sit down, uh, what is it, uh, palankang abhujitva, something like that, uh, which means you sit down cross-legged. That's what it means in the Pali. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we necessarily have to sit cross-legged at all times. Uh, and uh, bec and the, reason, uh, the reason why it has that in the Anapanasati Sutta is mostly because this is the way things were done in ancient India. People were used to sitting cross-legged. Uh, what is more important is that you are at ease and that you are comfortable. Uh, and this is why we have these wonderful chairs in the back here. Yeah, they look quite nice. So look at what, how I'm sitting. Yeah, I, I'm sitting like a king up here on this <laughs> this little bench up here. Uh, so uh, please make sure you're comfortable. This is the most important thing here, yeah. and uh, uh, and that is the right posture. The posture is the one where you are at ease, where you're comfortable, where you can sit for a sustained period of time. That is the right posture, according to uh, as far as I understand meditation practice. Uh, so change your posture a little bit. Sometimes you can sit on the floor. Sometimes sit on the chair. Yeah. Sometimes you can do uh, uh, do whatever. Just move uh, move around a little bit. Find something which works for you. Uh, there's no, nothing magic in the posture. Uh, sometimes you get given minute instructions on exactly how to keep your body, but actually it is not really required as long as you are at ease and you are relatively stable. So sit in a stable posture, yeah? Uh, that is what really, really matters. Uh, and this is really what we find in the Buddhist idea of the middle way, uh, yeah? The Buddha, he rejects the idea that intentionally causing pain in the body, uh, that works. Uh, this is what he does just before his awakening. He rejects the ascetic practices whereby you are almost intentionally giving rise to painful feelings in the body. Uh, and he rejects that, uh, and he rejects that together with the idea of indulging. Uh, yeah, Middle way, he says. Uh, and um, this is such an important teaching, is the very first teaching of the Buddha that these things don't work, and yet uh, it is something that is very often forgotten in the Buddhist world. So many of these various uh, techniques that people do in meditation practice uh, actually uh, have a tendency to give rise to lots of pain, sitting for long periods of time, not moving, and all of these kind of things. Uh, and personally, I don't think it is uh, all that useful, uh, and this is what I have also learned from Ajahn Brahm, and Ajahn Brahm is one of the best meditators that I know about. He has really profound meditation. He doesn't recommend recommend this because he, for him, he sees it as an obstacle uh, to going into meditation practice. Uh, and the reason it is an obstacle, and I think this is kind of the point to understand about this, uh, is that uh, uh, as long as there is an interest in the body, uh, you cannot really go inwards, you can't let go of the body. Uh. So as long as you have an interest in the body, there is a problem. Uh. Now the interest in the body can come from two sources. Uh, Either you can have an interest in the body because you find pleasure in the body. Uh, yeah, This is like sen uh, sensual indulgence of whatever kind. Uh, the body is happy. Maybe if you lie down on a really, really soft bed. Oh, this is so nice. Yeah, That is kind of sensual indulgence. Uh, so don't, maybe that is going too far. So I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, uh, but uh, so anywhere where you find happiness through the body in one way or another, some kind of sensual indulgence, that is a problem because then you have an interest in the body. Uh, and it's exactly the same thing. If there is pain in the body, you have a problem, uh, then again there is an interest in the body uh, because you want to get rid of the pain very often. Uh, unless you have the ability to really stand back and watch the pain neutrally, which is possible, but very often it's very hard to do that. Uh, uh, still, there is an interest in the body. Uh, so in a sense, the middle way is the path whereby you withdraw interest in the body. The body becomes irrelevant. Uh, when there's no pain in the body uh, and there is no indulgence or, or pleasure coming through the body, uh, then the body starts to become irrelevant. And when the body is irrelevant, that is when you can let it go. Uh. You can't let go of something that you are attached to, uh, and you're going to be attached to uh, these various feelings, whether good or bad, uh, uh, 
if you give rise to them in the wrong kind of way, and this is usually what happens. Uh, so the middle way, in a sense, in one way, is not really a middle way at all. It's a way whereby we can let go of the body and come to the mind instead. Uh, that is really uh, what this middle way is, is about. Uh, and this is so important, and I think I was mentioning before uh, how human beings, we, everyone, you know, wh whatever the culture or background we come from, we seem to have this idea that in the spiritual life, uh, physical pain is okay. Yeah, the English saying, "No pain, no gain." Uh, yeah, but actually, in Buddhism, it's the other way around. Yeah, no pain, lots of gain. Uh, that's kind of the Buddhist idea. Happiness, the right kind of happiness, is actually gain. So this, but we have this tendency to think that pain somehow, yeah. If and, and we, I think we get this from the moment, you know, from the time we are very young and very small. Uh, we are told to work really hard, yeah. Get, go work hard, so you get good grades at university and uh, or at school. And when you go get good grades there, you go to university. And when you get good grades there, you go to work. And then work really hard at work, because then you will be successful, yeah. And then you w work really hard. And then what happens? Well, then eventually you just die. Yeah, and all you've been doing is working really hard all the way, uh, and you wonder what was the point. Uh, yeah, it just becomes like this kind of habit. You have to work really hard, but actually, uh, so that's all pain uh, leads to gain. It actually doesn't even lead to any gain. Yeah, you, you eventually die, and then you get reborn, and you carry on in the same pattern. That's really what happens. And after a while, you think this is silly. What am I doing this for? Uh, and you turn in a different direction. Uh, so it's a very deep-seated thing in human beings, and if you look at some of the uh, various religions in the world, uh, it's exactly what happens. Yeah, it happens in Christianity, uh, where they also do ascetic practices and bodily mortification to release the spirit or the soul from the body, because the body is considered bad. So you do these things, it's cons of course in Hinduism. Hinduism is famous for these things, yeah, they are torturing the body. Uh, is found in Islam, apparently. It seems to be a universal human thing that we kind of want to torture the body. So be careful with that uh, and don't fall into the same trap and remember the Buddha's teaching of the, of the middle way. Uh, so uh, this is uh, where we start out. This is the very initial thing. Uh, and once you get that right, uh, you're already on the right track, and then you continue that. Uh, yeah. Once you are comfortable, then you feel. You start by just feeling the body and the mind, uh, and you allow tensions to go. You allow yourself to become really relaxed, really at ease, uh, just enjoying being here at this wonderful BGF center, uh, yeah, and with good company and whatever. And you really relax. The mind becomes at ease. The body relaxes. The tensions go, uh, and everything kind of dissipates. And there comes a point when you just want to sit here and you're so happy to sit here because it just feels so nice just to be relaxing uh, you know wherever you wherever it is that you are sitting here and that is the the right attitude uh. so the a trick here to be able to do this uh, is to keep things very simple in your meditation practice yeah a large part of the attitude to have to be able to really relax is to be patient uh. Just sit back uh, and allow things to be here. Uh, take in the, uh, the, the positive atmosphere, take in all of these things, and allow things to settle down. Uh. And this is very nicely expressed in one of the suttas. I'm going to read out this sutta later on, but this is like a preview of that sutta, if you like. Uh. And uh, one of the things the Buddha says in there is that this process of meditation does not happen through an act of will. Uh. It is a natural phenomena or phenomenon that actually just happens according to cause and conditions. Uh, it does not happen through an act, it cannot be done through an act of will, he says. Uh, so the will is actually a hindrance. Uh, the will is part of the thing which causes the problems in the first place. Uh, if you feel some tension in the body, where does that come from? Well, it comes from the mind. Yes, yeah, the mind that causes tension in the body. You are stressed or whatever, stress really happens in the mind and then it affects the body. Uh, so that is the willpower in the first place that has created the problems whereby we're not 100% relaxed. So now we have to do the opposite. We have to withdraw the willpower, withdraw the doing from uh, our present situation. And as we do that, as we withdraw all this doing and all the willpower, that is when pe things start to become peaceful. Uh, that's when you start to kind of allow things start to kind of calm down. Uh, so you sit back, uh, you're patient, you wait, uh, and all you do is really just be aware of the present moment. That's all you have to do. Uh, so we are kind of changing instead of putting so much uh, of our. Um, <coughs> 
in so much of our self, if you like, or our sense of self, or whatever it is, into activity, into doing, uh, we're putting it into awareness instead. Uh. So much during the day, so much of who we take ourselves to be, so much of what we are is activity, is all the doing stuff. Uh, but now we transfer our attention from doing uh, to being, uh, from activity to awareness. Uh. Yeah, so now you become the passive observer. This is one of those standard phrases in Buddhism. The passive observer, the passenger on the train, sitting back and just being aware of what is happening around you without reacting, without doing anything about it. And this is uh, already quite nice if you're able to do this. So what is it that you're aware of? And what you are aware of is just anything that happens to arise. Yeah, You are aware maybe your mind is probably thinking a little bit. Yeah, or, or you maybe hear a noise outside, uh, or maybe you, uh, uh, you feel maybe you feel a bit of pain in the body. It's impossible not to have a little bit of pain sometimes. That's kind of par for the course. Uh, and all of these things, uh, you are just aware of them, uh, and you are. Sti- it's like you are standing back. Uh, you're not really involved in what is going on. Uh, involvement means that you want to do something about it, uh, but you don't want to do anything about it. Uh, all you do is aware of the flowing stream of the world flowing past, uh, not actually doing anything with it. Uh. So it's so important here not to have any judgment, uh, yeah? not to actually say anything is right or wrong. Once you say something is right or wrong, then the doer comes just behind because it wants to do something about it. Uh, nothing is right or wrong. Uh, so if you hear a noise from your fellow retreatants, uh, yeah, don't think that this retreatant shouldn't be doing that or anything like that. Uh, if, if a fellow retreatant does uh, something which is a bit noisy, uh, then just let it be. Uh, yeah, it's their problem. Uh, it is their think of them like a robot. Robots do things. Yeah, they kind of look, look, move around uh, and they kind of do things like that. Uh, so remember, we are in many ways just like robots anyway. We are conditioned phenomena doing things according to past conditions. So whenever, don't allow yourself to be irritated by what any of your fellow retreatants do. I'll talk a little bit more about this later on. Uh, allow people to be here. Uh, just observe uh, noise arising, noise passing away. Uh, yeah, and when you get into that mood, you don't really allow anything to touch you, then you can stand back uh, and you can observe the world. Uh, and what happens when you, if you're able to do this, and this is gradual, you won't be able to do it straight away, it happens gradually. Uh, many of you have done a lot of meditation already, you know how this works, but uh, you stand back, and as you stand back, uh, things start to become more peaceful. Uh, you're not feeding the process that gives rise to the thinking, that gives rise to all the activity inside. You're not feeding that, because that is fed by the will, by the intention, by this uh, wanting to change things, that is what is fed by her. So by just being aware, uh, things tend to calm down all by themselves. uh, Yeah, become more and more peaceful. All you have to do is be patient. uh, All you have to do is to be non-judgmental. All you have to do is to be aware. And whoa, it comes down, calms down, it calms down. uh. And then as you calm down in this way, uh, what happens? Uh, You fall asleep, is that right? (laughs) That's one possibility, yeah? This is what, um, let's, let's face it, it's very common. Most people in the present world are tired. They are work too hard, they do too many things. Uh, there's always people who snore a bit in the audience. Uh, and if you want to snore a bit, please snore a bit. It's okay, you don't have to worry too much about that. Uh, and if you want to fall asleep, you want to relax or whatever, please do so. There's no shame in falling asleep in a, in a group like this. And most people feel tired, it's perfectly okay. And sometimes you, s- you fall asleep a little bit or you nod a little bit and then you wake up and then you kind of, you gain clarity afterwards uh, because the energy comes back into the mind again. Uh, so that's okay. So that's one possibility, yeah? And please allow yourself to, to these things to happen. Uh, don't force yourself in any way because then you are just making it worse. Uh, force never really works. Uh, so that is one possibility. But then when you have relaxed a little bit, uh, you have kind of got, got rid of most of your tiredness. Sometimes it can take a while. Uh, don't be impatient with these things. It can take a day even, yeah, before your mind kind of clears up properly. Uh, wh- once this gets cleared away, then mindfulness starts to arise. Uh, this is what I really want to say. Yeah, what happens then? Mindfulness comes. That's what I wanted to say here. Yeah. Um, so mindfulness starts to arise, and this is really what we are trying to get to. Uh, and now this is the cr- critical word you were just asking about before, yeah? Mindfulness. Uh, what actually is it? Uh, 
And uh, what it is, mindfulness, the way it is defined in the suttas, uh, and this is, uh, is defined in a sense in a twofold way. And one of the ways it is defined is as remembering things that happened a long time ago, what I have said, what I have done a long time ago. This is actually one of the aspects of mindfulness specifically mentioned in the suttas. Uh, and uh, uh, if you if you think about it, uh, when is it that you have a good memory? And when you have a good memory is when the mind is quite clear. You haven't got too many defilements going on in the mind. Yeah, the mind you have a sense of peace inside of you. That's when the memory is good, and that gives you also an idea of the other aspect of mindfulness. The other aspect of mindfulness uh, is just the ability to uh, to be to have awareness, basically. Yeah, you are aware of what is going on around you. Whatever you choose to focus on, you have the ability to stay with that. Uh, that is the, actually, even that is not really mindfulness because ability to stay with something is more like samadhi. Uh, but you at least you are present. Uh, yeah, you know what's going on. Uh, you have a degree of feeling of control over your mind. Uh, this is one of the things it says in the suttas, that you, it's called adipateya. It means like you have a lordship, you have a sense of control of your own mind. When you are mindful, you know what's going on. And if there is like something that needs to be done, for example, a defilement start to rise, you think maybe I might get upset about something or angry about something, because you're mindful. You know this is happening, you can do something about it. So you feel in charge of yourself. This is one of the feelings of mindfulness. You feel in charge of your life. And this is one of the p wonderful things. Uh, most of the time is we, are we are like these blobs, uh, you know, human blobs walking around, reacting to the world around us without really being in charge of things. Uh, and it's a terrible state to be in because it, uh, you, you, f you feel like this kind of, you're being manipulated by the world around you, including the advertising and all of these things. Uh, but when you gain that present moment or that awareness, it means you know what is happening and then you feel in charge of your life. This already is very powerful, yeah? It feels very good to be in charge of yourself rather than to be the victim of external circumstances at all times. So these are the two aspects of mindfulness, the, and both of them from the suttas, uh, remembering what happened long time ago and also having awareness. And these two things are very closely related to each other. If you have awareness, you have the ability to remember. If you have the ability to remember, you have awareness. So these things actually go together very closely. Yeah. So that's why they, you have two different definitions, which really they point actually to the same thing. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, ideally what happens. Yeah, you have uh, mindfulness arising in this way, uh, uh, but uh, and. Uh, but still, yeah, even though mindfulness starts to arise, you will find that even then uh, there is a tendency for the mind to sometimes go into the past or go into the future. Uh, yeah, you think about things or sometimes just fantasize about things. You're not sure whether it's past or future. It's like a fantasy, not really sure where, what is going on. Uh, and this is very nicely expressed in one of the suttas. In one of the suttas called the Bad Ekarata Sutta, which is One Auspicious Night, Majamanikaya, Middle Length Sayings, number 131. It's a very nice sutta, which has this beautiful little verse in there, uh, which is something like, uh, uh, you should not, uh, you should not uh, kind of go into the future, uh, because the future has not yet arrived. Uh, you should not look into the past, uh, because the past has disappeared. Uh, instead, uh, you should look with clarity into the present moment. Uh, yeah? This is what uh, this is what that Bad Ekarata Sutta says. It's only a short little verse, uh, but very beautiful and very. It gives you an idea of what mindfulness is all about and how it works. Uh, the ability to stay in the Pachupanna Dhamma. Pachupanna Dhamma. Pachupanna means present. Uh, dhamma is the present quality, the present state. Uh, so you are in the present, not in the past, Atita, or the future. Uh, yeah, the uh, Anagata. Oops, we're getting a bit of f feedback there. Uh, in the uh, okay, um, a little bit of feedback, I think, in the uh, system. All right, okay. So um, uh, you stay in the presently arisen state, which is the Pachapanna Dhamma. That's where you try to stay here, and uh, that is what this sutta says. Uh, so, what do? How do we actually do this? It may be obvious in a certain way that we. Uh, you should do this, we shouldn't go into the past and we shouldn't go into the future. Uh, it may, uh, it may kind of, it, it makes sense. <laughs> Getting some sound effects here. Uh, 
And uh, so we, uh, uh, but how do we actually do this? Uh, how do we, uh, especially when you have the, uh, the past arising, you think about something in the past, how do we get rid of the past? Uh, and how do we get rid of the future so we can actually stay in the present moment? And this is one of those very useful and important things to think about. Uh, uh, because it's easy to say, but actually doing it very often is, is quite hard. Uh. So, uh, and the, it's actually fairly simple. Uh. The way to overcome the past, thinking about the past, uh, is uh, uh, you have to understand that the problems that usually are associated with thinking about the past, uh, very often when we think about the past, uh, very often it has to do with regrets and things that happened in the past uh, that we're not happy about. Yeah? This is ver a very important part uh, of why we go into the past. We try to resolve issues or try to think about things that weren't, didn't go quite right uh, and then try to find solution to these things uh, so we can avoid the same problem in the future. Uh. So very often the past, maybe not always, uh, sometimes the past is also about indulging in the past, uh, thinking about, oh, it was so nice in the past, or you know, some kind of something you did. Uh, but uh, the problem of uh, having regrets about the past, uh, the way to deal with that uh, is, of course, to forgive. Uh, yeah, so one of the very important things, if you see things arising in your meditation that block you, uh, is then to forgive those things in the past. Uh, such an important part of the Buddhist practice. Uh, and when you forgive that, you can kind of uh, get rid of that whole burden in your life. Uh. So how do we forgive? Uh, and uh, a very important part of forgiving, and I talked about this at uh, quite a uh, lot of, uh, of length yesterday, uh, is the idea that uh, uh, people around us, usually when it's about forgiveness, it's usually about other people. Uh, people do things not because they want to be bad. Uh, people do things because they are conditioned to do things in a certain way. Uh, it's a very powerful thought. Uh, it's a very powerful way of thinking about the world. Uh, and it comes from the Buddhist idea of non-self. Uh, what we are, we are conditioned phenomena. Yeah? This is what we are. And because we are conditioned phenomena, the way what we do now, the way we think, the way we act towards others, uh, is not because we want to be that way. Actually, we want to be kind. Everybody wants to be kind because we know that's happiness. Uh, if we cannot be kind, it's because of the conditioning working on us. Uh, so, uh, in this way, when you look at other people, you know, and you, uh, or look at yourself, and you see yourself in the past doing something that wasn't perhaps 100% uh, right, uh, and we have all done that, yeah, we have all made mistakes in the past, uh, then remember that you too are a conditioned phenomena, phenomenon, just like people around you. Uh, and because you are a conditioned phenomenon, uh, you too uh, deserve forgiveness, yeah? So you forgive yourself for things that you have done in the past. Uh, instead of being hard, uh, towards yourself instead of being, uh, you know, too uh, harsh or whatever, uh, you have a soft heart towards yourself and you say, yeah, I probably couldn't have done any better than that. Uh, this was already, uh, you know, all these conditions coming together, my past or whatever, I did my very best, uh, but this was really uh, to be expected that I would make these kind of mistakes because of all that conditioning. Uh, and then you let go of those things, uh, yeah, and you kind of allow them to be, knowing that you tried your best, uh, but actually you couldn't do any better than that. Uh. And sometimes this can be hard to see, and the reason why it is hard to see is because it feels like we have choice, uh, yeah, and we think that we had choices, we think that we could have done better or whatever, uh, but that is largely a delusion. Uh. Most of the time we couldn't do any better, uh, yeah, we th think that we think that way, but actually when you, the more you hone in on that, the more closely you look at all the conditions coming together, uh, you start to realize, probably, uh, I was trapped, I was almost forced to do that, uh, even though it wasn't the right thing to do. Uh, actually, there wasn't very much I could do about it. Uh. So watch carefully what is going on in your mind, and you realize sometimes you just have to get angry. Yeah, sometimes there's no there's no choice almost. Uh, it's like all of these things coming together, and bang, you know, it's like a red traffic light. You know, you go red, uh, and then you become angry. Uh. <laughs> this is what traffic lights do, and you act accordingly. Uh. So this is a very useful way of looking at yourself, very useful way of looking at other people, and this is what makes forgiveness possible to a very large extent. Uh. And then, once you get that, once you use that Buddhist idea of non-self, uh, understanding that we are conditioned phenomena, you can forgive almost anything. Uh, 
And this is then it becomes so much easier to let go of the past. Uh, so if you see something happening while you're meditating uh, and you start thinking about the past, uh, try straight away to forgive that uh, or let go of it through some kind of, and if it isn't about forgiveness, let go of it in some other way. Uh, but straight away try to forgive, uh, let go of it. Uh, and if necessary, if it becomes too strong in your mind, maybe get up and do some walking or whatever it is. Uh, uh, there's a nice the terrace, uh, maybe, I, 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 are people allowed to go on the roof? Uh, yeah, they are allowed to go on the roof, okay. There's a very nice terrace up there, I've been doing a bit of walking up there myself uh, in the evening and things, really nice to kind of walk back and forth up there. Uh, you've got a special space now. Uh, so if, the, if some of these things get too intense, uh, sometimes you just get up uh, and you walk back and forth a little bit, you think about it in the right way, you forgive, you let go, then you come back and you sit down again. Uh, so you have to be wise about how you use your mind and how you use your meditation to make these things work out. Uh. So this is how you let go of the past, yeah? or this is part of how you let go of the past. Uh. What about the future? Uh, thinking about the future is so common. Uh. We think about what we have to do next, what we should be doing afterwards, uh, what we're going to have for dinner later on, what, we're gonna w what our work is requ requiring of us when we have to go back to work, what our family is, what we need to do at home. All of these things, yeah, these things are constantly on our mind because we're so used to having to do things. We have this ho kind of whole sheet of, of you know, uh, agenda for the next few days are things that we need to be done. Uh, and so these things are on our mind. And you forget something. Oh, no, I can't forget that. And you, that sticks in your mind, all of these kind of things. Uh. So how can we get rid of this? And uh, there is a, a, a number of things that you can do, but one of the things that I like to use sometimes, a couple of things I'm going to talk about. One of them is uh, to give meditation and your spiritual life priority. Uh, yeah, this is one of those very important things, to prioritize your spiritual life over the rest of your life. Uh, how do we do that? Uh, how can you prioritize your spiritual life? And uh, one of the problems in uh, uh, large parts of the world where they teach the mindfulness movement, for example, uh, is that the mindfulness movement is there so as to use mindfulness to enhance the rest of your life. Uh, yeah, they say, oh, when you become more mindful, you become more efficient at work. Uh, yeah, <laughs> if you're mindful, you become better a better kind of husband or wife or father or mother or son or daughter, whatever it is. Yeah, you become better in the family life. Uh, when you become a, uh, more mindful, you become a better sports person. Yeah, you, you, you kind of hit those golf balls better. Uh, I don't know if any of you, know, any of you here are golfers, but uh, yeah, so everything is about being mindful, getting in the flow, yeah, and then things really start to happen. Uh, so a lot of the mindfulness movement is about using mindfulness to enhance the rest of your life. Uh, and what that means is that you put the rest of your life on top. Uh, this is the most important thing. Uh, and your spiritual life is there to support the rest of your life. Uh, but because the rest of your life is on top, and that is the most important thing, uh, that is what you're going to think about. We always think about what is most important to us. Uh, and that is the problem with that whole approach, uh, is that we end up thinking about those things because they are what matter, matter in our life. But if instead you prioritize your spiritual life, uh, if you put that on top and you say that everything else actually is there to support your spiritual life, uh, then when you come down to meditate, uh, because all the other things are there to support what you are doing now, they're kind of irrelevant. Uh, you're not going to think about them, yeah? Because they're not so important to you. What you're doing now is what is important. Uh. So the idea of this is to think about your entire life as a spiritual practice. In your family life, uh, when you are, you know, uh, with the rest of your family, uh, you make that into a spiritual path, spiritual practice. Uh, you treat your family members in a way that is in agreement with the Noble Eightfold Path, with kindness. Uh, again, it doesn't mean that you allow your children to do whatever they want, that's not really what it means, uh, but it means you try to do it with compassion and understanding to create a good future for them and all of these kind of things. Uh, and uh, once you uh, subordinate, you bring everything in your life into the spiritual path, yeah? Then all of these other things, your work, yeah? That too becomes part of your spiritual path. Uh, you do your work in such a way uh, that you give it spiritual qualities. Uh, then all of those things, uh, they are subsumed into the spiritual life. It means that the spiritual life is the most important thing uh, and everything else comes under that. Uh, this is how you do this. Uh, and uh, this does not mean that you don't care about the other things in life. I, I always want to say that because sometimes people say, oh, what does that mean? Does that mean we don't really care for you know, our family and our work, whatever? No, it, does, it doesn't actually mean that at all. In fact, very often the other opposite happens. If you 
imbue your whole life with spiritual qualities, everything tends to become better. Uh, this is kind of the magic about this. Uh, even though you make it secondary, it is precisely by make putting the spiritual life at the top of the hierarchy, that is what makes everything else better as well. Uh. It has kind of this magical, this is the magic of Buddhism, this is the real miracle. Yeah, Forget about those other miracles, uh, this is the real miracle. Uh. Everything then turns into, becomes better, more positive and more useful. Uh. And then it has the added advantage uh, that when you come to your cushion, when you sit down, uh, all of these other things, because they are secondary, uh, because they're not really that important to you, uh, and because they all are subsumed into the meditation practice and the spiritual life, uh, you don't think about them so much. Uh, they don't matter. Uh, they are there to support what you're doing now. What you're doing now is what matters. Uh. So this is how you prioritize uh, the spiritual life, and straight away it takes away a lot of the interest in the uh, other aspects of your life. Uh. Another way of doing this, of uh, not thinking about the future, is to, and this is the thing that I talked about during the talk on Sunday morning, uh, is the idea of understanding uh, the sensory world in the right way. Uh. Understanding that the world outside of us uh, yeah, is always going to let us down, uh, is always going to end in suffering. Uh. At the end of our life, the last thing we do is dying. Yeah, that's the last thing we do in this life. And dying is one of the most difficult times in life for most people uh, because you have to let go of so much. Uh, so it always ends in suffering. This is kind of the weird thing about human existence. It always ends. You know, it m you may have a bit of happiness in between, but the end point is always suffering. And this is the problem with uh, uh, the sensory world. The whole sensory world is like that. Uh, it ends. It has uh, always going to let us down in the end. Uh, and uh, uh, the more you understand that, uh, yeah, I, you can. Um, everything in the world, the big picture in the world, what's happening in the world, you never know where the world is going to go next. Uh, yeah, you look, you, as, as I said, you can look at the news or whatever, and things always go in a direction, often go in a direction we don't like. Uh, and uh, that is because we forget that the sensory world lets us down. The world outside always goes uh, uh, in ways that are not really agreeable to us. This is what is the meaning of anicca. This is the meaning of out of control. This is the meaning that, uh, you know, this is the whole point, in a sense, uh, of these ideas on the Buddhist path. Uh, it's true in our family life, in our work life, everything outside of us. Uh, people will have to die, people will have to have to get sick, uh, things will, you know, our house sometimes get broken into, things get, things disappear, uh, or whatever it is, uh, and everything in that sensory world is unreliable. And the more you understand that, uh, the less you take refuge in the external world, uh, and the more you turn inwards. You think, oh, I've had so enough of that external world, don't want anything to do with it, because it is so unreliable, so uncertain, uh, yeah, and it always ends in pain. Uh, let me turn inside instead. Uh, and inside of us, uh, at least, we have some say. Yeah, we can choose inside of us whether we want, at least we can choose to some extent, you can't choose absolutely, because even within ourselves we have uh, habits, patterns, we have ways we have been doing things, so even there we have a limited control, but at least we have more control on our inner lives than we have on our external lives. Uh, we can choose to some extent whether we're going to be nice or not, uh, we can choose to some extent whether we're just going to sit down and be peaceful or not, uh, and this is, uh, this is the good thing here. So I'm contradict you may notice I'm contra contradicting myself a little bit. Before I said, um, forgiveness comes from understanding that things are always programmed. Now I'm saying you have some control of your inner life. Uh, yeah? So you have to kind of be able to keep those two uh, there at the same time, because they are both true in a certain sense. Uh. But if you want to ask about this, you can ask about this during the Q&A, and we we'll can go into this in more detail later on. Uh. So. Um, this is, uh, uh, this is what you do, and this is exactly what the Buddha said we should be doing. Yeah. He said, finding the refuge within, uh, yeah, being an island unto ourselves. I'm sure you heard that expression. It's a very common expression that uh, people use. It comes from the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, where the Buddha says, look inwards, not outwards. Uh, what is that inward looking? It is the four satipatthanas. Uh, it is meditation practice. Uh, yeah, that is where you go into your inner world. That is where you find a real refuge. Uh, and this is how you do that, by remembering how uncertain those things outside are. Uh. So these are some of the uh, hints. And once you, uh, 
know that the world outside is uncertain, well, there's nothing really to look forward to. Uh, yeah? Very often we look forward to the future, we look forward to things, uh, but when we understand how unreliable, uncertain it is, uh, why should we look forward to the future? Uh, yeah, the future becomes kind of irrelevant. Uh, the future becomes uninteresting because we don't know what it has in store, in store for us. Uh, sometimes all it does is bring suffering instead, uh, instead of actually bringing those things that we uh, think uh, it, it will bring. Uh. So and one of the nice contemplations there is to think of yourself as a person who has no future. Yeah, you ha don't have a future. Usually that's kind of a, you know, if you want to put someone down, you say, yeah, you have got no future, yeah, or something like that. Uh, but actually in Buddhism, it's a good thing, yeah, not to have a future. Yeah. We are, you are, there's no future because the future is uncertain, it's unreliable. So what's the point of even having a future? Actually, it doesn't ha have any point anymore. Yeah. And if we could die at any moment, well, again, uh, it's so uncertain that the whole future, let go of the whole future. I have no future. Yeah. Okay, well, if you don't really don't have a future, there's nothing much to think about. Uh. And this is why you see that when you see someone di is dying, and they have been a good spiritual person and have been living well, they often become peaceful. And they become peaceful precisely because now it is so blooming obvious uh, that you have no future. Yeah, there's no doubt anymore. You definitely don't have a future. You're on your deathbed, uh, absolutely certain. Uh, yeah? So, and that's why you become peaceful. Uh. But let's not wait till we die, because then, you know, it's good to kind of use these ideas now. Uh, yeah? If you have no future now, wow, use that idea in the present moment. Uh, and then it dies down, it becomes peaceful, uh, and then uh, you can actually be in the present moment. Uh. So these are some of the ideas you can test out, uh, try them out, see how they work for you. Remember, these ideas, I, the reason why I repeat them so much is, bec because first of all, because I learned from this myself. Yeah, I think, yeah, I should do that myself, I think, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but also because when we, the more we do this, uh, the more we think about it, the more it sinks in. It takes a while for these ideas to sink in. Uh, and you may have noticed that, you know. You may have been listening to the Dhamma for many, many years, uh, but sometimes you realize, why, well how come I haven't thought about that, that before? It's so obvious. Uh, and then gradually uh, the meaning of these teachings actually start uh, to uh, have a deeper effect on us, and then they start to work out in the meditation and all these things. Uh. So this is, uh, uh, this is how you then gradually make the mind uh, present, more mindful, more aware of what is happening. Uh, but if you really want to make the mind fully aware, there's another ingredient that is important uh, to make mindfulness really powerful. Uh, and this is the last thing I want to talk about now, and this is the starting to enjoy the meditation practice, uh, where the happiness starts to arise inside. You feel the pamudja, you feel the pity, you feel all of these happy feelings start to arise. Uh, as long as when you feel happiness inside, uh, mindfulness starts to become very strong and the reason is because you want to be in the present moment. Uh, sometimes people talk about contemplating pain in their meditation and uh, sometimes it can work for some people. I don't want to dismiss anyone's meditation practice, but uh, it's a terrible thing to do that. Uh, but uh, I also want to uh, express the meditation as I understand it from the Buddha. Uh, and the way the Buddha describes this, uh, and the way he describes the whole process, and we'll have a look at this later on, it's all about happy internal feelings. Uh, and of course, what this does to you, uh, when you have a happy internal feelings, mindfulness becomes very strong, uh, because it's so nice to be here. You don't want to be in the past, you don't want to be in the future, you don't want to be in a fantasize about anything. Uh, yeah, you want to be present. And it's very natural, it's very easy to be present because you, it is natural to want to be there when you're happy. Huh? So this is the power of happiness and this is why if you look at the, the way this particular sutta works that I will read out for you later on, uh, this is why the cause for samadhi in the sutta, samadhi is where the mind becomes completely unified and you stay with the object continuously, the cause for samadhi is always uh, sukha. Happiness, yeah? Sukha, very profound happiness, is what makes samadhi possible because you don't want to be anywhere else. Uh, you want to stay with the object. Uh, that is what makes samadhi not only, nat it makes it natural and easy. You don't have to use any kind of force whatsoever. The mind wants to be there all by itself. Uh. So this is the ideal thing, yeah? The more happiness you have in the mind. So this is where we kind of want to head after mindfulness. Uh, the next step then is to imbue that mindfulness with happiness. Uh, 
When I say all of these things, it sounds like there is like a strict sequence to these things. But of course, uh, there isn't any absolute or strict sequence. Uh, sometimes you find a bit of joy arising a li little bit earlier on. Sometimes it comes much later. Sometimes the uh, the mindfulness comes, but there is more th uh, more thinking there, and so th there is, a, you know, these things are not kind of absolutely sequential. Uh, what I'm giving you now is a rough outline of the sequence of how these work. Uh, there will be a little bit of overlap between these things, uh, so some of this will be you will have to uh, investigate uh, and look at whether this actually uh, works for you and and how it actually works in your particular circumstance, and then uh, you gradually uncover how these things work in your own life. Uh, so this is the happiness that we, we come, and how can we give rise to this happiness? This is kind of the really significant issue here. And everything in meditation practice, so much of it, uh, is about the attitude that we have. Uh, having the right attitude matters so enormously. The things that I've been talking about already, about uh, having, the, uh, making your spiritual life the priority, uh, and uh, remembering the uh, inner refuge, uh, these are already kind of attitudes and views about the reality. Uh, but you also need attitudes that are more conducive to giving rise to joy. Uh, and I will uh, remind you of some of those attitudes during the guided meditation. Uh, and one of them is just to feel a sense of gratitude. Uh, yeah, Wow, I'm here at the BGF Center. Uh, what a wonderful thing that it is that there are places like this in the world. Uh, it is not given. This center only has only been here for about three years. Is that right, Bobby? Five already? Five? Uh, gee, time goes so fast. Uh, yeah, Five years already. Uh, but it's still not that long. And before that, you had this, it was, you know, the BGF Center lived in this premise that were very simple and basic compared to this one. Uh, what a wonderful thing it is that we can be here. Uh, and there's a nice atmosphere here. Uh, it is uh, not too noisy. Uh, yeah, you can meet with companions that have the same aim and purpose in your life. Uh, you can sit down together. You can build up some energy and feel some energy together. And then, uh, uh, so you build up this positive perception in yourself. Uh, how fortunate you are to have these things in your life. Uh, yeah, And I think the same thing for myself sometimes. How fortunate I am to be a monk. Yeah. What a wonderful thing it is. I can live in a cutie by myself in the forest. Uh, people bring food to me every day. Uh, yeah, They just come to the monastery like magic. They come to the monastery and food just arrives. Uh, isn't that great? Uh, and uh, it's it's you know you sometimes you forget how fortunate you are and how lucky you are you forget to count your blessings uh, but there's so many blessings in our life uh, and um, uh, of course the gratitude there really goes to the Buddha because the Buddha is the one who established all of this uh, and he is the one who enables us now to to enjoy some of the consequences of his hard work uh, two and a half thousand years ago and this center here also is a consequence of that hard work yeah people have donated millions of dollars mil millions of ringgits to be able to build this place uh, and now we can all enjoy the benefit of that I'm sure some of you have also donated to, to that uh, yeah so you also have part of the center that's another thing to rejoice in her. Yeah, if it weren't for you and your donation, it wouldn't be here. Isn't that great? Yeah, and s this is the way you inspire yourself uh, and you feel a deg degree of happiness. Uh, you think about the people around you. Uh, what a wonderful thing it is to have friends like this. Yeah, spiritual people who practice in the right way, people with good hearts. Uh, you have a sense of metta towards the people around you. Uh, so these are uh, the ways in which you can give uh, rise to a little bit of joy in your meditation practice. Uh, there are other ways. The Buddha talks about the Sila Nusati, the Chaga Nusati, the Sila Nusati being a contemplation of our uh, a virtue and morality from the past, uh, our character, uh, yeah, understanding that living a moral life is a very positive thing in this world. Uh, it gives other people freedom from fear and all of these kind of things. Uh, and you can rejoice in the fact that you have maybe kept the five precepts yeah, for many years. Uh, what a wonderful thing that is. Uh, um, uh, you can rejoice in your generosity. Sometimes all you have to do is sit back and just allow some of the memories from the past to uh, uh, arise in you. And sometimes those memories in the past, if you have some very powerful, beautiful memories from the past, uh, just allow those to rise naturally. Uh, and then joy sometimes can arise. Uh. Yeah, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, so you ha again, this is one of those things. You have to learn how the connection between your ordinary uh, experiences in the world, uh, uh, your experiences of being, of doing the right thing, living well, and then how that connects with your meditation practice. Uh, and when you start to see that connection, uh, then you can actually use it 
more easily uh, to uh, give rise to a sense of joy and happiness in your meditation practice. Uh, and then you have the idea of you know just being, having the Dhamma, having this astonishing teaching in the world, uh, which I have made the point again and again that this is uh, the meaning of life. Uh, this is what everyone really is looking for. Yeah, You have these teachings that give you the meaning of life. Isn't that amazing? Uh, yeah, that is enough to give you a sense of joy that you have this, uh, everything else in, in the world is kind of completely, almost like irrelevant compared to this, if this is the meaning of life. Uh, yeah, you have the blueprint for the meaning of life. Wow, cheapest! I didn't even realize I had that. Most people, they come to the Dhamma, they say, yeah, I do a bit of meditation, do that, but we don't really understand that this actually is about the very meaning of life itself. And the more you get into these kind of ideas, uh, that this gives you all the answers you ever were seeking for throughout your entire life, the highest kind of happiness, the ending of all suffering, everything you ever desired comes through the Dhamma. The more you get that, the more gratitude you get to the Buddha, the more gratitude you get to these teachings. And then that inspires you. Huh? So this is uh, you know, part of the idea of Dhamma Nusati and Buddha Nusati, understanding what these things really are. They really are astonishing things. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, again, uh, you can give rise to some of that joy, and that, so these are just little tricks, and these are things again from the suttas. This is how the Buddha said we should give rise to joy, uh, and then based on that joy, then the meditation uh, really starts to take off. Uh, but these are the higher stages of meditation. Now I've given you a kind of the whole stretch from the very beginning, uh, to starting out by relaxing uh, and ending up with the happiness and joy that takes you all the way to samadhi eventually. Uh. So, uh, there you are. I've been talking for about an hour already. And um, so, uh, these are some of the uh, hints that I would, uh, uh, that you may want to try. Please just meditate according to your own way and how you feel it works for you. My job is just to kind of give you little hints and to inspire you on the way. But your job is to know what works for you and how your practice works out. Uh, and my job is not to tell you what to do, it's more to kind of give you just a little bit of guidance, hopefully, and then hopefully you can take it from there into the right direction. Here. Okay, so I'm going to uh, stop there. We had this about half an hour uh, before the uh, meal, so I don't know. So whatever you want to do, do some meditation if you like, or uh, uh, presumably, uh, whatever you have to do, and I will just uh, go back to my room for the next half an hour, and then we'll continue this afternoon at, what is it, 1.30? Uh, Bobby, is that right? Uh, 1.30, yeah. So we'll see you back here again at 1.30, and then we'll start with the uh, suttas. And, uh, no, this is the wrong, the wrong timetable. Okay, some suttas and some guided meditation and some more suttas later on this afternoon. Uh. Okay, so see you later on.